Today, we are honored to be with Dr. Paul Mohabir. He's a clinical professor and one of the directors of the medical ICUs at Stanford University. One of his specialty is pulmonary critical care specialist. So doctor, um, how are you? You look very relaxed and uh, you must be doing well, better these days than a year ago. Things are substantially better, yes. It's the first reprieve I've had in probably a year and a half. So I'm pleased to be able to take time for well-being right now. Wow. Just thank you so much. And um, I wanted to touch base because, um, yes, about a year ago, um, I posted your weave and we were contacted through our close friend, Justine Stamen for the project 100 Days of COVID. She's you were one of the earliest stories and testimonials that I did post. And you really fueled my inspiration for the project. I really, really do honestly mean that. Can you describe the days around that posting of the weaving? So uh, mid-April last year? Yeah, it was a, um, a time unlike any time before. You know, essentially we were placed into this pandemic and I've actually been ex had the experience of being in a few pandemics before. I'm actually from Toronto, the Toronto, Canada area. So I had exposure to the SARS um, epidemic at that point. And, you know, as you know, there were issues with Ebola at one time mm -hmm. and then H1N1. So I've lived through a few of them and experienced them at least in a training perspective. But coming to this level of a pandemic where we experienced here, um, it was new to me in that I was in charge. I was I finished my training. So it was really me at the end of the day with multiple other people who have trained at my level to manage a cohort of patients that we didn't really know what we were doing. These patients were not behaving like the usual patients who are going into respiratory failure. So we had that uh, mental delay as far as what does this mean? How do I process this? But the other processing that I, we had is, you know, your own mankind and your own children. I have two young babies. Um, one is three and one is two, uh, a year and a half. And my and grandma lives with us. So I also had that emotional aspect of what does it mean if I'm going to be a COVID intensive care doctor, which is what I chose to do. And I selected only that unit. How does that impact me um, and my life and my friends? And there were certain, obviously, social stigmas associated with me doing this. So in that time of tumultuous time, we had no idea what was upcoming. I had made a decision exactly that period when you had contacted or Justine had contacted me about this weaving. I had actually left my home and decided to move out for a month since I knew that I was going to be exposed to these patients directly. And, you know, we know when we jumped into the deep end, I um, moved out and that was really difficult. You know, we had a newborn at home. I did for a month. So that, um, sorry about that. That's that ultimately became such a horrendous nightmare where you were seeing your children via zoom, the world of technology had changed. Everything became audio visual. Mm -hmm. and you lost that touch and I, it was not fun. Um, Justine, um, a good friend of mine, very good family friend and same with our other friend Claire who had also made this dedication and contribution to me. Mm -hmm. And we're reaching out as friends, not knowing what to do and sending food a daily mm -hmm. to help out. And I just kind of felt this island alone for a very, very long time. Um, at the time when this started, things that were running through my mind is we didn't know what isolation meant. There were world recommendations that if you had exposure to COVID, you had to be isolated for your family from seven to 14 days. Again, we didn't know what it meant at the time. Mm -hmm. So I ultimately made some strange moves where I just started working one week, isolated at home, away from home that other week, went back to work. So I just kept going every other week, which is unheard of. Mm -hmm. But I did that to consolidate my time. Oh, mm -hmm. and then just do what I needed to do, take that two weeks after and then come home. And I spoke to a few other colleagues and interestingly, some did the same. Mm -hmm. Some opted to battle at home and to do things the right way. And, and as, as, as to, after the first two months, I just did not want to be away from the kids anymore. And I felt early on to it, this is just a new way of living indefinitely. And I can't live away from home. So we moved back with extra precautions. And as you and probably the world is aware, Things changed weekly, they changed hourly, mm -hmm. and even up to day, things are better. As I said, it's been 15 months since I really moved away from the COVID ICU, and now you're actually taking time to celebrate yourself a little bit with the angst that this is, you know, a reality that will resurface. Look at India right now, look at various parts of the world, certain states within the U.S., 
So I think we're just getting ready for our next wave. Hopefully not in California, but that's just a small, small insight into my life. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, I don't even think that scratches the surface of what has gone on through my mind through this time. Um, mm -hmm. I, I will add one thing. I, I talk about saving life and humanity and doing our part, but being a new parent to take that risk I've taken it because I chose that to study this. This was my dream to be involved in some degree of greater, not just local goodness, but greater goodness. Mm -hmm. But when you have two children, you change young children, your whole philosophy changes. And I, I had a mental battle with work and doing right for the world mm -hmm. and the unknown of bringing this infection up to children that, you know, drugs were not approved or still not approved for under the age of 12. And do I want to chance that? Right. So those were battles, um, you know, a little bit about, I, we took a lot of chances in this world. My partner and I decided that we just wanted to give back. And it sounds very cliched, but we mm -hmm. felt if we're going to get a dog, we're going to get a rescue dog. If we want a babies, we are, we're going to procreate. What we're going to do is help a child. So we actually fostered, um, adopted one baby and foster adopted a second child just to give back to the world. Oh. And that was a struggle yeah. thinking we're trying to do right, but do I want to take away from that by adding insult to this um, if you will, this karma you're trying to create for your next life. So mental struggles were significant during that time. Mm -hmm. Jeez, if we didn't have people like you working on the front line and making these sacrifices, we would have not pulled through um, like we we have, uh, or, or it feels like we are coming out of. Wow, what 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 a conflict, right, between family and what, what you want to do. If I understand your whole practice for this period has all been dedicated to COVID. And that's I, correct. I see. And you continue to do that today. I do. Um, I, you know, it's interesting. The, I am an intensive care doctor in general, so all types of intensive care. But during this time, I'm one of the co-medical directors of the ICU, and I also do all the scheduling. And it's interesting how when pandemics come around or crisis, you learn that your colleagues who are just the best people in the whole world, they start declaring things that, you know, for various medical reasons, excuse me, emotional, psychiatric reasons, they do COVID ICU. So a bunch of us who were able to, you know, and wanted to, it was they we valued the wonderful work they were doing for all the non-COVID patients. And we did the work with the COVID patients. Everyone did their part. Mm -hmm. um, so an answer specifically to your question. So I did my entire 14, 15 months to COVID. Um, mm -hmm. I did not do any other cares. And now that we are fortunate enough that the numbers have mm -hmm. substantially reduced, I'm able to integrate back to regular intensive care. So I think just last week was my first time seeing a non-COVID intensive care patient. And it was it was refreshing, um, but I do sadly to admit miss taking care of the COVID patients because I kind of know what to do now. Oh. There's a pattern. They're oh similar. The yeah. tragedy is great, but the rewards of those you save are even greater for something that's new to the world. So I, I think it, it's it's complicated. Um, but yes, I have been doing COVID the entire time. This is kind of corny, but <laughs> I want to tell you that I my favorite show right now is to watch um, this series called House. Have you yep. ever seen that? And I love the you know things that yep. he goes through trying to figure these things out. And so I could just imagine the way you're talking, like, oh my God, this is like, you know, we don't know what we're doing. We don't know how to, what people are going to experience. We don't know the outcomes and all this kind of stuff. Was it kind of like the drama that the series projects i have seen a show once um oh, okay. i trend I think that i just live it every day it's like you don't need to come home and see it again but i will say i could more than i've seen a couple half episodes i will say their documentation is excellent um the one thing they don't show which i think is important to convey to most people is yeah, yeah when you first see the patient there's the drama and the discussion but once that drama is over which is usually after a day Mm -hmm. Then it's this anticlimactic discussion. Yes, sounds good. Keep doing that. I Yes, this seems to be working. Make a little tweak here. Mm -hmm. So I don't think anyone wants to see day two and day three <laughs> on a, a big screen because impressive. But it's more of the, the academic pontification of, you know, what it could or could not be. But yeah. Yeah. So I wonder, you know, the, the pitfalls or the uh, things that weren't handled correctly, you know, the, the was there a shortage of supplies and could we have been better prepared? What is your analysis of the whole situation? I think that very importantly, the declaration for PPE was a very important thing to do. Um, we are fortunate here in California, at least my area at work at Stanford, that the hospital was 
excellently prepared for PPE. So I think that we were fortunate that we did have a surplus of patients, but we were well protected. I will add that the other institutions may not have been worldwide. And it's just a matter of supply and demand, Mm -hmm. right? I think that was a major barrier that a lot of places had, uh, which made it very difficult. But I think we were on top of that. I think the other pitfalls um, that really we experienced is how are we treating these patients? And this may be technical, but when we first started, there was a philosophy that if you're sick from a breathing standpoint, put everyone on the breathing machine, let the lungs heal. And the world doesn't see that. But we did that. And then we realized, wait a minute, wait a minute. They were stuck on a life or we couldn't get them off and there was a higher death, mm-hmm. presumptive death. And then you would, you know, that's, we learned six, four weeks into this, wait a minute, this is not working. And then we tried a separate approach, which is, okay, let's not put them on life support. Let them not really struggle with requiring oxygen, but let them live their days of as long as we can without life support. And we found that that was possibly, um, the evidence hasn't supported this yet, but certainly a better outcome in patients. Um, and who knows what it means for the next phase with the new variants, which we have not seen any here as yet. But I think, as I said, we're talking about things changing, our, our practice changing. But what I do appreciate is people who are doing COVID, I'm proud to, to acknowledge and the teammates that we're doing this, that we continue to do this. Even I would say worldwide, for those who've experienced it, it is a burnout. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a mental accomplishment and a, a mental weariness, mm-hmm. but to, for those people to continue doing it because they know all the kinks. They've mm-hmm. seen what has worked and what has not worked. And we basically build our repertoire in our mind as far as how to improve survival. Mm-hmm. So if you ask this, hopefully this not, does not continue, but if it does, I am frontline. I want to do it again because I have a lot to offer, I believe. Oh my God, thank you so much. And was there a lot of sharing amongst the medical communica- uh, medical community? Yes, our institution is so proud of Stanford. Um, every week they did, did a grand rounds, which is a basic, you know, a presentation from some lead author or speaker worldwide. And basically every week, a new presentation on COVID. And that was really state of the art, where we are at, at that mm-hmm. second and that moment. So we had weekly academic, uh, which is... Uh, you know, presentations open to the everyone. Secondarily, we had constant exchanges with large academic centers. New York, we had invited them to speak. We invited people from Italy to speak. We had Fauci speak with us. So we were in constant communication. Also when um, Boston went through their crisis and we spoke to them. So we had constant communication. In fact, today's Thursday. Um, Yesterday, we had grand rounds with India. Mm. Leaders in India telling us their current exposure. Oh my God, yeah. So- we are privileged to have that contact. Um, and yes, we have shared enormous amount of information. Mm-hmm. Do I feel that the information has changed our practice? No, but what it has done is create a united front amongst us that it's almost some form of therapy. We're all seeing it together. We, mm-hmm. share, we share experiences mm-hmm. and maybe make tweaks to the practice, but, but to appreciate other uh, people's issues. You know, mm-hmm. India just told us they didn't have remdesivir, which is a medication that we have just sitting around, mm-hmm. at least our institution. Mm-hmm. But they had, they were a shortage of, you know, the dilemma between that drug is it's not really shown to improve survival, maybe shows to, has demonstrated to decrease hospital length of stay, but we're desperate. So mm-hmm. we use these drugs because it's all we've got. Mm-hmm. And it's almost this mental game where you say, okay, I don't think it's going to make a difference, but can we give something? Because it just doesn't feel right to just say, well, we're just going to hope for the best, which is, and support them on life support. That also is not very reassuring as well. So I think we we grieve together and we hear each other, our stories together, but we can help as best as we can just to be there and to let someone hear what you're going through. And if you will commiserate together as well. Mm-hmm. So you must have witnessed a lot of sorrow um, a lot of family separation. And so, yeah, the, the mental health that you're talking about, um, that's a huge part of it, right? It's much more than people think. Um, I, again, when <clears throat> in the intensive care, I've learned over the years that death is a natural process, not life, but in my world. So I, I try my best to separate that, even though it's hard, mm-hmm. the acknowledgement that people will die and my emotional involvement with that. I just, you know, you, you high guide people through the processes. Mm-hmm. The issue we had here was so unlike any other death experience where it's not just people dying, which I understand. It's the fact that they were dying alone. Mm-hmm. 
based right. on visitation policies, based mm-hmm. on not a lot and COVID you know, issues that we couldn't have families actually come by the bedside. So that was a real struggle. It came to the point which I'm, you know, most hospitals did not allow visitation, period, end of story, mm-hmm. uh, which I completely accru- approved of. Mm-hmm. I think it ultimately came to the decision where we had to deal with uh, longevity versus mm-hmm. morality. Mm -hmm. And it became a moral issue for me particularly. So Mm -hmm. we had voiced some concern about our well-being, that being the physician Mm well-being, which includes the family well-being, about not having the family members be by their bedside. Because the illustrations you see on television are Mm -hmm. true, where the physicians, the nurses are holding patients' hands as they died. That is a reality I've never seen before. And it's it's a horrific depiction of what the world has come to. So... We, I would actually was add to co-lead and co-chair a committee at Stanford, which looked at visitation policies, taking into account our ethical and moral dilemma, family complaints, and not complaints to formal complaints, but their their needs and their pursuits, and really implement some policies that were, you know, frightening to some people that were going to allow certain people under certain situations. But it was the best thing we had done, we could ever have done. And I will, I'm glad to report, I just had a visitation meeting prior to this meeting. We've really contracted no cases at all from patients to or family members because we've been strict and thoughtful and still been able to restore or to continue that emotional bonding during that last phase of people's lives. Mm. Um, so that's something that people don't talk about, mm. that how hard it must be to not, to, to sorry, to die alone. It's not a good process. It hasn't been at all. Yes, well, that is, that is so intense. Um, so do you, I mean, you mentioned that you were involved uh, briefly with some other pandemics. Do you, what can we do? I mean, I hate to mention that there may be another pandemic or anything, but what can we do to prepare for it better? This has been a life lesson. You know, the largest loss, I think, has been years and years of Spanish flu, as far as massive casualties that we've had. Uh, <clears throat> we have learned a lot. There are a lot of practices that have been written about. I've authored numerous um, publications looking at, um, not numerous, a few good publications looking at COVID and the management of these patients. So this is the first time in in, in this, <clears throat> I think, this period where people have been publishing their knowledge in, um, if, you know, being able to manage these crisis situations. Mm-hmm. So what we can do, honestly, to prepare for the future, I think there's nothing. But I do believe that at current state and practice, what we could do is adhere to strict, strict policies of what we need to do. And I'm an advocate, and I voice this all the time, of the need and the mandatory need for vaccinations. Um, it's, you know, as you, I'm sure you're aware, there are people have their many opinions and mm-hmm. discussions. Um, my plug is that, you know, we know the studies, we've reviewed the studies, the people who are frontline are able to visually see the impact of what's happening. And this is not, to me, a personal decision. It's a global decision. It's a moral decision to have seen. It's um, ethical decision. So sometimes I'm hearing people talk about what they want. And I, I just start informing in a very respectful way that maybe we should think about what the world needs. Look at India, look at the rest of the world. It's not stopping. So I'm a firm believer that people spend a lot of time saying they want to do better for the world. And we all, I'm not, the physician thing is not about that. It's we all try and do something good. Um, but there comes a time when you're asked to do something simple. Mm-hmm. And if I say to people, the good you can do, would you put a mask on, get a vaccine? I'm not asking for anything else. Mm-hmm. you would save a life every mm-hmm. second mm-hmm. and it would not be you infecting someone else. So this is the time where people have to review and assess their conscience mm-hmm. and really review what they, their personal, personal dilemma with studies and maybe look at the global picture. Uh, so that's my plug overall to the world. Yeah, no, thank you for that um, very well expressed um, thinking. And uh, I hope a lot, a lot of people can take note and hear about that. Um, so places like India, wow, I just can't fathom, you know, what they're, but um, so vaccine is the hope you would say for, for that situation too. I would say that it's a start, mm-hmm. right? I'm pretty choice with my words, you know, as I said, things have evolved and changed and mutations. <clears throat> we were looking at this, the next six months are going to tell us more information, but if you have something that offers Mm -hmm. benefit and i was really intentional with what i said earlier where these drugs like the remdesivir Mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. which has been talked about, have not really been that influential of changing mortality. Mm -hmm. But we have something now that has demonstrated that. Mm -hmm. And yes, it may change in time, but we have something. Mm -hmm. So it's do that something now, bring mm -hmm. down the quantity of, expo of, of you know, infected individuals and decrease the quantity of death mm -hmm. and allow this thing to fade away if we, if we can. Mm -hmm. um, so it's the first time that something matters that mm -hmm. can help. I think that's it. And I just, it's just a very difficult thing for me to process how we have something, but people have opinions now. Mm -hmm. Yes. about why they yes. shouldn't take it. So it's it just, it's troubling. I respect everyone's opinion, but I, I have a problem, not necessarily respect, but understanding when we're in a global, this is the world that is dying. Mm -hmm. The world's on fire, right. it really is. And I'm, I'm not thinking right. about Canada, California. I'm thinking about across borders. I'm reflecting across the world. I, you know, I've traveled to India so many times. I love India, but, mm -hmm. you know, this, these are colleagues, they're friends, they're reaching out. The doctors are reaching out, crying, saying, this is what we're going through. It is, they're going through the pain that we went through back then. So um, the world doesn't get to see that. Right. We see that every day. So it's, it's yeah. frontline was an interesting word, right? Mm -hmm. What it really never even thought about the word frontline, but it's more, it's the emotional frontline that I'm more worried about mm -hmm. than the frontline of getting infected, which is a, a risk, which is a mm -hmm. risk. Sure. But, yeah, one of the other projects I'm doing um, is um, making art, recognizing the people, uh, memorializing the healthcare workers who have passed away. So this is a project that I collaborated with The Guardian and Kaiser Health News. But, you know, it's over 3,500 of people who passed away, um, the healthcare workers on the front line. It's, it's atrocious and you know, it, it really shows the sacrifice that you that you make, your profession makes, you know, day in and day out. So again, we want to thank you. If you don't mind, can you give us an example of two patients? One patient that showed a lot of resilience and then another one that maybe illustrates the trauma that, that they had to go through? It's a fair question. Um, I'm going to start with the, hard, the common and sadly it's the <laughs> uh, the worst one, the second proportion as far as who's taken the trauma of it. Mm. And sadly, the majority of them are going to fall into this. So this is a culmination of all of the, wow. the majority of patients. Wow. The trauma is the ultimate failure of the lungs that they are put on a ventilator. Mm. The, that ventilator that is supposed to keep you alive is really just breathing for you in hopes that your lungs can actually do better and heal on their own. That trauma where we are blowing volumes into your lung and blowing these lungs up and causing more inflammation in the lungs, the trauma of that ventilator that causes a pneumonia, the trauma of something referred to as this, what we call, we're thinking now patients with heart disease may be at increased risk of dying from heart disease from this. So it is so mentally and physically traumatic that this infection, this viral infection, had, leads to a cascade of not just lung failure, but heart failure, ultimately secondary infections and systemic failure. So living through that and then hearing, and only 50% of you or, uh, or um, will, will survive this or significantly less than 50% will survive this. So you go through this, this tragic, terrible road with all of these things I've mentioned, and most people go through each and every one of these, and I left out bad clots in the lungs and clots in the legs, and to a point where you may not even survive this, uh, where the odds are against you just getting on there. So that trauma on their body, we've talked a lot about mental trauma and family trauma, but we can't forget the, the physical trauma these patients must be going through. And I, I am an advocate that we must express that just because we sedate someone and paralyze them and they don't feel things, it's a physical body mm. that just because you're paralyzed and you cut someone doesn't mean you haven't injured the soul or the presence, the physical being. So this is pain that's happening to someone, whether they mentally sense it or not. Mm. So that's part of the trauma. Okay. Um, now, uh, sadly, as I mentioned earlier, that's the majority. Mm. Wow. Now let's talk about the recipient. Yes, those that subset that make it through that ventilator inflammation, the ventilator stress trauma, that subset 
our left on ventilators for two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks. That to me is some degree of resilience because at that point, they're not giving up. They're, they're not, they can't breathe on their own, but we can't get them off the breathing machine. And I'm happy to report that it's a good and a bad, this double-edged sword of this disease, I tell you, um, it's incredible. But we have a subset of patients now that they have awakened to a pleasurable level. Their physical strength has recovered, but COVID has damaged their lungs so, lungs so irreversibly mm. that they can never live off in the ventilator. So we have been transplanting, lung transplants uh, to these patients. Oh, yeah. That's resilience. Mm. So this goes back to my that um, people are die. Mm. I think, <laughs> with, I don't know if it's, it's I'm not, it's spiritually based, religiously based, I don't know, or in the cards or cosmically based, but people have their time, whatever that time is for them, in their, in their cards. So the hundred year old is not ready to die. And I've had a hundred year old that's had COVID, not ready to die. They're going back home. And then we have the 30 year old that says, this is not for me. So I think people are called at a different level because they're being called. Mm -hmm. um, and no matter what I do, no matter what magic potions we put there, they may not, that resilience may not happen. But back to that philosophy, those people who are resilient and their cards are not ready to be pulled and say, it's time to leave this planet. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that move on. They're the ones that are offered the transplant. I can tell you for those we've done, it's resilience. And what a great choice of words you use because I would not have used that. Um, I, I, those are the ones that you feel great that you can offer them something. Mm -hmm. But to comment, again, review the double-edged sword, Here's the problem, right? Mm -hmm. Then you get transplanted, you're 30 years old, and there's a whole different, which people are not aware of, there's a whole different clock that starts ticking based on that, you know, the rejection of a lung. It's a new thing. It's a renewed, uh, another chance at life, but it's a different life. And it's not this, the greatness people think it is. Um, yeah, resilience. <laughs> so mm. that's, that's the world that's out there. And they're not many of the latter. Majority are the first former traumatic situation I've told you about. Jeez, can you put that in, sorry, some percentage? So how many um, are that fall into you know, surviving? Yes, I do that. The ones that are not doing well, I would say six, six, zero, 60 percent are doing, don't survive. Okay. Um, and our experience, 60 to 65 percent. So that leaves that, you know, 35 to 40 percent who are stuck on the ventilator. Yeah. And here's the issue. A small percentage, I'm going to say maybe three, one percent are offered a lung transplantation because there are other criteria for that. Okay. And then you might ask, well, what about that subset of that, you know, 30 percent that are sitting there on the ventilator? Mm -hmm. Sadly, they're sent off to um, long term weaning ventilator facilities, let, let their days on ventilators with the hope of resilience, getting off the ventilator. And we never really get to see those outcomes or ultimately they sit there in time sitting on the ventilator and end up either the family decides this or the patient says, I don't want to continue as such. And we transition mm. to comfort where we take the ventilator off. So they're not necessarily dying of the COVID, but it's a personal decision because they don't want that long road and arduous road that has no chance of guarantee of getting better right. or they die of secondary infection. I see. Oh, so, I'm yeah, so it's, 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 not that great. But again, again, 30 to 40%, you know, as I said, might make it home too. We see the successes, right? Mm -hmm. We would not be doing this job and I would not be having this great conversation with you if I thought 100% died because then you'd have an answer up front. Okay. Don't continue this. Why put people through this, right? So we are, 5% of survival is good enough for me to give people a chance. Jeez. A lot also has been talked about uh, economic disparity, you know, how healthcare has failed that. Um, did you witness that at all? Or um, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I will say I didn't w witness it, but I will tell you that that's factual. Like that's nothing that is debatable in the literature. Mm -hmm. People, the societies, races, socioeconomic status, financial status, mm -hmm. um, geographic areas, um, fear of uh, physicians, fear of hospital, healthcare system, mm -hmm. have all impacted people as far as the way they get cared for their access to healthcare mm -hmm. or their distrust in a system to go to healthcare mm -hmm. for, for help. 
Um, the best I can speak to is the environment in which I work is. I see those who come to me and we do the best. Everyone's treated equally. Mm. Yes, sadly, there are uh, there is a racial preference for certain people to be affected and have a worse uh, outcome. Mm. The African-American Latino population, and it's certainly endemic to our area, uh, mm. but they're generally those the most common, the ones that do the, the poorly. Um, but I would say as far as how they're treated, in, at least I'll speak for myself and my colleagues. Um, and I direct the critical care medicine fellowship training program. So I train, I'm the director of patient, uh, all trainees in critical care. Mm. Um, at least the teaching is that we treat everyone equally in the best that we can in our capacity. But it is very truthful that there are centers out there or areas that are not, there's despair, we'll leave it at that. This has um, been so profound, your talk with me. And I feel I, I've been, <laughs> of course, during this whole time, I've been living a very isolated life and I, I don't experience that kind of front line or I, I feel like it's almost like a battleground that you went through. And um, we truly appreciate it. I, I, I bow down to, to, to you and the whole out <laughs> there, you know, all, all the ones that made these big sacrifices. Um, but I, I, I think you probably agree that we're, we feel grateful that we seem to be coming out of this. And um, again, I really share, I really ex want to express my gratitude to you and, um, well, really being a part of my project here. And um, I want to you know, spread the word of how people have really worked and sweated and all that, you know, gave them all of it, all they could to um, this terrible pandemic. I appreciate your kind words. You know, I'm, uh, this is a great time for me just to, you know, people don't really ask these questions too often, right? So it's, it's just, you live with this in your mind and you know it, and every day it's great. I will say there's no burden that's on my brain. It's just, these are the things that come out naturally, mm -hmm. but it's, it's nice to be asked mm -hmm. about things that are so deep down in your mind that mm -hmm. it's like, oh yeah, that's, that's really what we're seeing every day because sadly it's become natural, mm -hmm. right? So it's just because it's become the commonplace every day. So it's not something that it's talked about as much. Um, so yeah, I appreciate you kind of reaching out and asking those questions. And I, I, I'm happy to be a voice too. Right? So I think it's nice that you're actually, your art, first of all, it's beautiful. I'm not a person that likes pictures and um, I will admit, I looked at your stuff and it's wonderful, but in some weird, sad way, I was like, oh, thank God I have a mask on. I just don't like seeing my, my face blown up, but but I did think it had impact. Oh, I no, looked no. at it and I was like, you know, the colors were vibrant. I remember the day, I have to say this, it's a strange day when I went in when I get incredibly stressed, which doesn't happen often, um, and I do this every couple of years, I wake up in the morning and say, ah, no vanity, I don't wanna worry about anything. And I literally, the day before you saw that picture, I went in, I just shaved my head bald. I walked out, my partner's like, what are you doing? Ah, we don't need to worry about hair and shampoo and all of that. So I just shaved it all up. You had, you didn't have any long, I had long locks before then. So I got rid of it all and just said, let's just start fresh and let's make some major changes. So. Yeah, you just, um, it was a very pivotal and transitional period too. Oh, geez. I mean, to me, it was a very handsome portrait, a very heroic po um, portrait and very heartfelt. So again, I appreciate so much that you participated. And um, yeah, I definitely gonna send you, you know, a weaving of that. And so thank you again. Oh, I mean, I do wanna say, <laughs> I do wanna give you a chance. So is there anything else that you would like to add you know about the experience or hopes and things no no i think this is a shout out to you actually that people are shouting out to us all the time i think the power so my partner's an artist which does a lot of bronze statues and oh. and paintings and the power for what you're doing to express what's inside our hearts and our minds because we don't have the time to do that and no one asks us these things and nor does anyone I think people really do care that what we're going through, but Taichi, I want to say something. This is a, it's going to make come out the wrong way, but I know that in time, as time passes on, there's something called COVID fatigue. The concept of this diminishes in people's presence and the forefront of their brains. It's yeah. not, they know you're out there, but you become less important, but our battleground doesn't change. Right? Yeah. So when you immortalize these things in, in art, 
that installation, I tell you, it's like I looked at it. I looked at your website a couple of times. I'm like, wow, it's a reminder that you're representing us that it's actually not going away because there's a lot of literature now saying, and I hope that's not me, and I don't think it will be, but post-traumatic stress disorder, Vietnam War, um, these can these these survivors um, from the war are left with these traumas, and there are speculations. A lot of we actually published on this recently that. We speculate a lot of healthcare workers, and I should say healthcare, first line, because mm-hmm. everyone's important, mm-hmm. um, are going to have specific, significant PTSD, and that's going to carry them on for after the pandemic. So it's just for us, it's someone that actually went inside us and put it there to say, let's not forget, let's not forget the battle. Oh. That's really what I thought. When you said first 100 days, mm-hmm. I was thinking... The, about 9-11, I actually reflected on that, thinking about the wall that was there. Mm-hmm. And again, I'm not trying to put myself on that pedestal. I want to put people, other people there. But mm-hmm. first thing I thought is, oh my God, how wonderful for those individuals that who really put their souls out there, mm-hmm. that there's a way to remember them 10 years from now. Mm-hmm. Right. So it was really wonderful. And I will add that you said something inspiring to me um, that if you ever are looking for someone to help with the dedication to those healthcare workers, I'm just trying to build my, my own philosophy in my brain Mm -hmm. that somehow where I could make that contribution, because for those of us who survive, Mm -hmm. it's also coming from a different type of, um, you know, gift that you could me somehow give back to those people who are by my side, those nurses that did the job for me, that I walked in, left the room, and then the people who sat there all day, they need to be commemorated or or something more than that. I don't think that's even enough, but if you could get me involved in something with that with you, I would love to mark my silent presence for that. I don't need any credit. That's not what I'm asking for. That's not my style. I'm an introvert, like to hide in the background. <laughs> but if that's something or some type of artistic involvement, I would love that opportunity. Great. You know, you're you're such an elegant ex- spokesperson for all of this. So definitely, um, wow, that, that, that means a lot to me. Thank you. Um, and yeah, no, I, I sometimes think about the power of art, but uh, you put it very well you know, just so that we don't forget. And uh, let's move forward and and think of ways that we can do that. But thank you again for sharing your time and uh, we'll be in touch. And I, 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 I'm so touched by your t- spending the time to talk about this, but. Well, feel free to reach out should you have any other questions. I'm always okay. here, I enjoy these type of things. Oh, thank you. No, truly appreciate it. And take care as we come out of this. And um, best to you, best to your family and everything. They, they made Thank it. You. Okay. Thank you. And last question: How do we see this in LA? Is this available? And how do I do? Can you? Is this installation there that I could just visit? Uh, yes. Yeah, so um, the Japanese American National Museum finally reopened, and okay, uh, they, uh, the project Hundred Days of COVID went up. And they will be up until May 16th, so not much longer. But um, okay. you need to uh, reserve online for tickets because it's a kind of limited. Got it. You know, trying to control it, but yeah, and then I w- I definitely want to send you a catalog that we we made. So if you could okay. somehow send me, well, I'll, I'll email you, but get your mailing address. And then again, we want to make a you know a weaving for you to keep his memory but uh, it's all great well, awesome that. so again uh i i can't even say enough times but thank you <laughs> thank you so much so appreciate it you're okay. wonderful all right have a great rest of your day thank you, you all right bye-bye bye-bye